A few weeks back, I was having dinner with the family of my godsons, and the phone rings. It's the vicar for clergy. To my knowledge, I hadn't caused any public scandal, nor did I lose vast sums of the parish's money. But you know as well as I do that answering a call from the vicar for clergy's office always takes a bit of courage. I was asked to give a brief reflection on friendship with Christ as charity. Though an extrovert, I'm hardly an expert on friendship. Though a priest, my life is not exactly the paradigm of charity. Though a Christian, I am but a continual novice in following Jesus. Nevertheless, here I am and here you are. So let's make the best of the remaining time together. Some of you know my story. The pertinent part is that my dad's job at Rocky Flats made our family move around a lot. I transferred schools every year from the second grade until the eighth grade. More than anything, I desired a best friend and simultaneously considered the pursuit of one to be a fool's errand or a feat of impossibility. Thus, friends were easy come, easy go realities of social self-occupation. So when Jesus claims, but I have called you friends, As a middle schooler at Sacred Heart in Boulder, I remember erroneously correlating that with the ascension, Jesus leaving, just like every other friendship in my life. Thus, when the apostles were impelled by the Spirit to go forth in boldness, to teach and to baptize, it was a working for a distant Jesus more than a working with him or even because of a friendship with him. During my eighth grade confirmation retreat, I received a grace of an experience of personal love from the living Jesus, and he was inviting me to the priesthood. It took years to escape the heuristic of Jesus founding a pyramid scheme institution and my just doing better in the seminary or in the priesthood was a seeking out of praise to be employee of the month. But honestly, my initial nervousness at Father Angel's call was an indication that there are times when I still care more about what the chancery thinks of me than what Jesus thinks of me. Admittedly, that's my fault and not anyone else's, and it reveals my tenuous friendship with Jesus at times. I tell you all this because friendship has always been an elusive reality in my life. I distinctly remember my first chrism mass as a seminarian, in which Monsignor Bult, while giving the jubilarian honoring, commended the priests for their decades of service to our Lord through times of desolation. Even when this Lord of the forthcoming resurrection also seemed to be like a ghost for long periods of time. This had really struck me. Had some of the priests suffered what I did, the notion of continuing the work of Jesus, but on our own. And our only recourse is to work harder. I self-diagnosed that there were times that I was working in the vineyard of our Lord and running off of the fumes of youthful and idealistic Jesus-esque zeal and not recharging, not renewing, not reviving myself with a personal friendship with Jesus. Throughout my time in seminary, I began to grow a devotion to St. Andrew. He's mentioned three different times in the gospel as bringing people to Jesus or mediating that connection. Peter, the boy with five loaves and two fish, and the Greeks. And providentially, his feast comes up almost every year at the beginning of Advent. Andrew is an on-the-ball, type-A, bishop's secretary material kind of guy. (laughs) Long before the Messiah is made public, Andrew is on the prowl as a disciple of John the Baptist. He's a man who puts his thirst into action, who's willing to pave the way. Perhaps that's one of many reasons he is devotionally known as the Protocletos, the first called. He was among the first to whom the Lord said, come, follow me. But can you imagine what Andrew was feeling 
after the Peter, James, and John trifecta was formed. He had discovered Jesus before it was cool, and certainly before Peter, his brother. He had brought Peter to Jesus. Now he was not in the inner circle. Jesus goes up a high mountain with the other three latecomers, Peter, James, and John. But Andrew was the first, yet is seemingly excluded. How many times do we as priests think of ourselves on the outs when we hear that this brother was chosen for further studies, that brother gets a posh assignment, Why is everybody else chosen and I'm set aside? So what graces would Andrew have needed, not only to keep following Jesus, even in the shadow of his own brother, for the remaining years of his public ministry, but also to give his life for Jesus and for the message of the gospel? Such meditations help me as I grow in being a fledgling pastor. All throughout seminary, I had dreamed of one day being a pastor of a parish, a father of a people. But to do this, what graces would I need, and how would I grow? Throughout this past year, it seems the only ways that I've grown is in my stress level, my lack of self-confidence, and my waistline. (laughs) This is because the bulk of my spiritual life is based on one little preposition, for. I keep doing pastoral activities for Jesus, and not often enough with Jesus. I know that I'm a capable, hard worker. I, too, possess Andrew-esque qualities. I'm a pro scheduler, a techno whiz. I love having a large Rolodex in my head. But sometimes it's my own working qualities that force me to implement pastoral ministry for Jesus, as if he's the CEO and I'm in lower middle management just hoping for a little praise. Friendship with Jesus is transformative. Friendship is necessarily a reciprocal relationship of give and take. It requires goodwill on the part of both parties. Clearly, Jesus supplies that one in spades. While I have goodwill to Jesus most of the time, sometimes I can foment ill will or plain old gossip and complaining regarding facets of ministry. I lament how hard things are or transfer the attention to imperfect realities around the diocese. Can you believe the latest email or all these decisions from on high? If friendship is based on mutual benevolence, goodwill, then it entails the sharing of good things. Thus, friends share of their intellect how they see things. This enables them to pursue a truth together, a clearer vision of reality as it is and not how my opinions want it to be. It entails a sharing of one's own will. How many times have we reminded our congregations that love isn't a feeling, but it's to will the good of another? The sharing of one's feelings or emotions is also at play making known how I am affected by the events of my life in vulnerability is essential to friendship. This then includes the revelation of secrets of the heart to those who are trustworthy. We often hear of total self-gift in the context of the marital act, but self-gift is for friendship too. Friendship with God, brother priests, and other relationships. Marriage is, after all, a certain type of friendship. And marriage is one of God's favorite relational descriptions with us. The self-gift of intellect, will, and passions to God first enables us to be received when we give ourselves. Contrary to this, I've come to find in my own life that at the root of priestly gossip, cynicism, or complaint is a fear of not being received. So instead of giving myself, I insert myself. But I let my snarky opinions stand in as a false, less valuable, less vulnerable form of self. Each of us has, at one point or another, embarked on the venture of friendship with a brother priest, 
only to be let down or mistreated. Suffice it to say the obvious. Jesus, who himself is a brother priest, will never let us down. He is pure love, caritas, charity. But sometimes I wish he were not just pure love, but also pure ease. We all know that his command to carry our cross daily. Muscling or white knuckling through the carrying of our cross often leads to our own short-sightedness. I keep doing my own priestly work for Jesus. He's the king, but I'm a pawn. Yet I've said at every mass, through him and with him and in him, not for him. It's not about working harder. It's not even about working smarter. It's about working with Jesus, alongside him in friendship, the sharing of my life with him who is love. Thus John 15 resounds, without me, you can do nothing. But Jesus, I can crank out a homily on the fly. My October mass counts are pretty good. My email response time is better than average, and I'm a priest who actually RSVPs. <laughs> and I've got my finance council in check. But none of that means the inclusion of Jesus, going about my priestly ministry with Jesus. The scary thing is, in our priestly lives, you and I can be a kick-butt priest on paper and still reach the pearly gates only to have Jesus say, I do not know you. You did not become friends with me in your priesthood. Three antiphons, the three antiphons for morning prayer for the Feast of St. Andrew have a very beautiful progression. They start, two men followed the Lord from the beginning. One of these was Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. This movement starts with Andrew following Jesus. This is the slow conformity of Andrew's will with that of Jesus. It's the beginning of friendship. As Jesus teaches, the apostles slowly start to acquire the mind of Jesus, seeing things the same way, a necessary step towards friendship. The next antiphon stops me in my tracks. The Lord loved Andrew and cherished his friendship. Cherish. What a word that is. The only other place off the top of my head where we use cherish is in the rite of holy matrimony. Letting Jesus love me, cherish me, has been my hardest, has been among the hardest of the endeavors of my life. It has meant that I stop striving to be the priest I think he wants me to be and letting him love me into the priest he wants me to be. Not a working for him, but a through him, with him, and in him. Here in this liturgical context, we acknowledge not only Jesus' love, but also his friendship. The middle school version of this talk would be entitled, Jesus doesn't just love you, he likes you. <laughs> Andrew must have reached a point of mutuality with Jesus where he was no longer just accomplishing tasks for him but doing them for the sake of love and friendship. You can't cherish a one-way friendship. So for Jesus to cherish Andrew's friendship meant that Andrew received and reciprocated the love and friendship of Jesus. The third antiphon goes, Andrew said to his brother Simon, we have found the Messiah, and he brought him to Jesus. Real friendship involves the sharing of goods, among them, friendships. Andrew proclaims the fruits of his searching, bringing his brother to Jesus, a move that, in earthly eyes, means his, he will be eclipsed by his brother. Sibling rivalry is the cause of great unrest in our world and in the priesthood. Think of the first two brothers who ever existed. How did that go over? Think of the two sets of priest brothers Andrew and Peter, James and John, vying for attention, careerism, personally self-driven political success. Think of our own relationships here in this room. 
is there unforgiveness that still remains from brothers once assigned together? How many of us see our brotherhood with one another as overflowing from a friendship with Jesus, a total self-gift to Jesus, the fruit of this friendship being charity? Thus, charity in a truer sense is not philanthropy, giving money, but rather a giving of one's self. It is a growth in love of God and neighbor, even with brother priests, willing their good and sharing ourselves in a context of friendship. After all, it was said of the early Christians, see how they loved one another. We pray in Eucharistic prayer too, remember Lord your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of Then again comes that preposition, together with the Pope, the bishop, and all the clergy. Our friendship with Jesus is to overflow in a friendship with those brothers whom God has given us. Brotherhood is a given reality. Friendship is a chosen reality, incumbent upon the choice to share oneself first with Jesus and then with a brother. To conclude, Presbyterorum Ordinis exhorts, by the reason of the same communion in the priesthood, priests should realize that they are obliged in a special manner towards those priests who labor under certain difficulties. They should give them timely help and also, if necessary, admonish them discreetly. Moreover, they should always treat them with fraternal charity and magnanimity those who have failed in some manners, offering urgent prayers to God for them and continually show themselves as true brothers and friends. May we, like Andrew, allow Jesus to love us. May we give ourselves to him that he may cherish our friendship and grow our brotherhood and the church herself to the fullness of charity. Praised be Jesus Christ.